Okay, so you all know that fish oil is good for you, right? <laughs> but not necessarily. I didn't necessarily so. Fish oil and fish oil and fish oil. There's different brands of fish oils around. Most of them are very badly formulated. We have problems with pollution too. You know, you know about heavy metals. But the oceans are also full of other chemicals that we've just thrown in there. Polychlorylated biphenyls. You might not be so familiar with those, but over the long haul, eating small amounts of those chemicals, which come from electrical transformers, these chemicals leach into the groundwater, they get into the oceans. Very bad for you. Bad for your bones, bad for many other tissues. Then you've got the organophosphorus and organochlorine pesticides. They're there too, they're highly bioactive. They get into the marine food chain, not good for you. Now, of course, Zinzino and Lisi take extraordinarily high standards when it comes to this sort of thing. And the oil that we use is extremely pure. It meets all of the internationally accepted standards. But there's other problems with, uh, with fish. And that is that there aren't enough of them. If you do some very simple calculations and you work out how many people actually need more omega-3s in their diet, not the omega-3s from plants like chia or flax, they don't work, but the, the real thing, the omega-3s from fish. And then you divide that by the amount of fish that there are in the sea, and that works out that we don't have enough. We cannot give people all the omega-3s that they need without fishing the oceans dry. So this is not an issue of how you spend your weekends, whether you like to fish personally, that's not a big deal. We're talking about industrial fishing. And the way that that works is we send floating factories to sea and they hoover the fish out of the oceans and that's taken to industrial plants where the fish is sorted, the oil is processed, purified, and then the very best of that fish oil is used by companies like Zinzino. And to that, we add this very special, very high polyphenol pre-harvest olive oil, and it's the combination of the omega-3s and the polyphenol that really makes this work and sets us apart from really just about anybody else that's working in this space. That culminated in the first balanced products, which have an unparalleled record of effectiveness. I can't tell you how many clinical scientists and doctors that I know and that I work with who use these products personally and give them to their patients too, even although they cannot legally prescribe them. These are becoming accepted products in healthcare systems all over the world. And then we went for the Mark II version where we took a technology that had originally been developed for a completely different industrial sector and we brought it into our manufacturing process and came up with a fish oil that dissolved magically, made micro suspensions in water, fruit juice, Coca-Cola, beer, anything you like. It just makes the oil taste and the flavor disappear. And that was a real step forward for people who don't like drinking oil, and not everybody does. That's a great technical advance, but it doesn't solve our problem. It doesn't solve the problem that we simply don't have enough fish, and we do not want to totally destroy the marine ecosystem. That would be bad for everybody. So we went back to the drawing board, and we said, well, where does the omega-3 in fish oil come from? And many of you have seen this slide before. Fish don't make omega-3 fatty acids. They obtain it from the food that they eat. And right at the bottom of the marine food chain, you have marine algae, seaweeds. And in the same way that crops on land produce mostly omega-6s and some omega-3s that you can't really use, but it is the marine crops, especially those that grow in cold water, that produce the omega-3s that we need. So you can go and harvest seaweed. You don't need the fish. You go to the base of the system where the omega-3 is actually produced, the long chain omega-3s, and you can harvest the seaweeds. And this has a whole series of advantages. It's an alternative to fish. 
and these grow incredibly quickly. So you can harvest the seaweed, and then very quickly it regenerates. It's highly renewable. It creates a lot of biomass, more so than the amount of biomass you can grow on land. Why? Well, usable biomass is dependent on how much energy the plant has. But a plant that grows on land has got to build a lot of structural components because it's fighting against gravity, right? Seaweed doesn't have to do that. It can pour more of its available energy into the synthesis of, amongst other things, omega-3s and a whole range of very interesting bioactive compounds. And some of these are very rare, extremely rare. You don't find them in terrestrial plants at all. You don't find it in herbal medicine. These are a whole new range of compounds which uh, Ian Rowlandson and other colleagues of mine are exploring at research centers all around the world, and they're going to be generating a whole range of a very interesting and exciting new nutrients, phytonutrients, which we will eventually incorporate into our portfolio too, but it's early days. Obviously, you're not competing for land space, so you can harvest seaweeds without taking land out from soy or corn production or cattle raising, if that's what you want to do. It can fix carbon dioxide. There's a problem with carbon dioxide, whether or not it's responsible for climate shift. I don't think anybody really knows yet, but let's assume that there's a possibility that it might be. Carbon dioxide fixation is a good idea, and harvesting marine biomass is one way of taking carbon dioxide out of the oceans and out of the oceans. Finally, if you want to use seaweeds as a bioaccumulating system, as a purification system, they can be used in that way too, because as they grow, they bind various types of pollutants, including heavy metals, and that's a way of removing those from the oceans and cleaning up the mess that uh, some of our industries have made. So this is a very interesting new growth sector, a new agricultural sector, you could think of it as, and it has many applications and many uses. And it started off, as many of these sectors do, on a small scale, individuals were starting to get involved in this. It was manually intensive, and in the second generation, we saw the introduction of more elaborate, more effective harvesting systems. And then people began to think, well, if you're growing in the ocean, we can't really control all the variables. Wouldn't it be better if we were to bring this on land, put it into a closed system where we can guarantee there's no contamination, either by microorganisms that we don't want or pollutants of any sort, and that led to the development of the very first bioreactors. And the way this works is you take your marine algae, or whichever specimen or species you want to start with, you put it at the beginning of the tube, you flush the tubes through with the correct medium, which in this case would be seawater, and as the algae grow, they pass through the system. By the time they get to the end of the system, they're fully grown and ready to be harvested. And this is a very effective, very high density way of producing large amounts of usable biomass on a very small area of land. And this kind of system, you can build it into different sizes and shapes. It's infinitely scalable. It's not a matter so much what it looks like, it's what you put in. And this is one particular marine microalgae that we find very, very interesting. It's called a Skypsochytrium. That's the uh, Latin name. You don't have to remember that. What you should remember, what you might think is worth remembering, is that this microalgae grows in a lot of the oceans. It has been recognized by EFSA for a novel food, so it's legitimate to use it as a food or a food supplement. And very uniquely, this microorganism, over half of the biomass consists of triglycerides. These are lipids and over a third of those are DHA. This is where the fish get their omega-3s from. So all we're doing is we're cutting out the fish. We're going deeper in the system. And we're not disturbing the marine food chain because this has all been taken out of the oceans and is being done in a very controlled, very pure system that is now being started to be scaled up all over the world. In fact, there's one system a very good one right here in Stockholm, which I visited. So instead of using fish, we're starting in this occasion with the marine algae, then we're adding the olive, polyphenol rich oil as before, and that gives us the vegan balance oil.
So this is not like the plant oils you get from flax or chia. Please don't make that mistake. They are a very different kind of omega-3. They're a kind of omega-3 that you cannot use. The body can hardly use it all. This is the real stuff. This is what the fish use. This is what they contain. This is what your body needs. So once... Woo! So let me break down the composition of it for you because it's actually very sophisticated. I think it may be our most effective product so far. So the ingredients, break it down, 45% is the oil that is derived from this microalgae. 35% is the high polyphenol virgin olive oil. Echium oil, 20%, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Mixed tocopherols, which is just an industry standard, that's to keep the oil fresh and sweet while it's still being manufactured and while it's being stored. And then vegan vitamin D. Now there's two strange ingredients in there, echium oil and vegan vitamin D. The vitamin D, I mean, everybody knows, well, geeks know, we get that from lanolin, right? It's animal source. Vegan vitamin D is a little unusual. Some of you may have heard you can get it from mushrooms. You can get it from mushrooms if you shine ultraviolet light on them. Mushrooms generate vitamin D just as we do when you shine ultraviolet light on us. But most mushrooms produce vitamin D too, which is not necessarily the form of the vitamin D that you want. And we wanted something better. But let me show you first of all what Echium looks like. This is Echium vulgare. And it used to be considered a weed. Its name, its common name is, pop, is uh, purple viper bugloss. And what we now know is that seeds of this plant that was formerly a weed, but that were now being planted out commercially, contain a very interesting fatty acid called stearidonic acid. But more of that in a moment. This is where the vitamin D comes from. This is vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, which is the form that you want. And that comes from lichen. Now, lichen is a very complex organism. It's actually a symbiont. It's a symbiotic blend of a fungus and a cyanobacterium, called a microbiont and a photobiont. It's an extraordinarily complex biochemical setup. Looks very simple. This is what reindeer is like to eat. But this is an extraordinarily good source of vitamin D3. No animal is involved, purely vegan. But it is exactly the vitamin D that our bodies use. So breaking it down a little further, 200,150 milligrams of alga oil, 1,604 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids. That's in the content of five mils. EPA and DHA are there at the levels you want. The oleic acid, the omega-9 is there. And now I can go into a little more detail about the echium oil, why we put it there in the first place. What is so special about echium oil? Well, again, it's not like flax, it's not like kia, it's not like any of those things which really are nothing more than a confidence trick because your body cannot use those. Echium oil and one or two other sources which we're starting to cultivate and exploit now, just there's only a handful of them, contain something called SDA. Now, SDA is short for stearidonic acid and it's not a short chain omega-3 like you find in most other plant oils. It's not quite as long as the omega-3s you find in fish oil. It's intermediate. And in fact, it's a part of the metabolic chain that occurs in your own body. When you eat the very short chain omega-3s, your body struggles, it doesn't do very well, but it manages to make a very small amount of this. Once you've made this, the transformation to the very long chain omega-3s, the ones you really need is easy. In fact, this converts at a rate of 30%, whereas LA from things like um, flax, your conversion rate for that is about 2 or 3%. So this is a step change. This is a much better source of the long chain fatty acids you need. But, now it gets a little more complicated. SDA has additional anti-inflammatory actions all of its own. It's different from EPA, DHA. It suppresses the release and the metabolism of arachidonic acid. So it's actually adding to the functionality of fish oil by combining this, as the polyphenols do. We're building something composite here that hasn't ever existed before. And this produces anti-inflammatory activity that, from my perspective, makes this the most important clinical tool that I think I've ever seen.
but then it gets even worse because now we have to add in an omega-6 mm -hmm. GLA gamma linolenic acid yeah I know we've been saying omega-6s are bad and you have too many and not enough omega-3s yeah that was kind of true but the reality <laughs> It's kind of complicated, and as scientists, we have a kind of a duty to make things as simple as we can, to make them understandable, and not go too far to the point where we're actually falsifying data. So let me channel Einstein for a minute, who famously said, everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simpler. He was right. Omega-6s in general are not good for you. And in general, we have far too many of them. But GLA is an exception. It is one of the omega-6 fatty acids that has additional anti-inflammatory effects all of its own. This is the fatty acid that you find in blackcurrant seed oil and borage. And if you look through the herbal literature, you will see that GLA and those oils also have a role to play in folk medicine because they have their own anti-inflammatory effects. So here again, what we're doing is we're extending the profile of the fatty acids in our product to provide additional functionality. I'm very, very proud of this formulation. I think Sinzino has done a wonderful job. <laughs> Any of you like the Smiths? You remember them? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, I'm more of an Alice in Chains kind of guy, but I like the Smiths too. They're okay. You know, if you're neurotic and live in a basement. <laughs> and that was their great album. And if you want to take the moral high ground and say that meat is murder and be a vegan or a vegetarian, I'm absolutely fine with that. I don't share your principles. I enjoy being an omnivore. But up until now, I think vegans have been unfairly penalized. You know, if you can't eat fish oil, what we find when we measure their lipid profiles is they have really unhealthy 6 to 3 ratios. Which is one of the reasons why being a vegetarian or a vegan does not guarantee better health. In fact, they don't live any longer than omnivores do. A minor difference. It's insignificant. So now we can actually rectify this. What we can now do is to provide a source of omega-3s that will allow you to remain in balance and hold on to your lofty moral principles. <laughs> At the moment, this kind of vegan omega-3, the algal oil, is a little expensive. The margin over fish oil is quite significant, and that's reflected in the way in which these products are being priced. But what will happen is that as the bioreactors become more popular, and we're seeing more and more of them being built now, the algal fish oil will be commoditized, its price will continue to fall. At a certain point, I think it'll be approximately the same price as fish oil and looking further ahead it's actually going to become less expensive as these bioreactors continue to be developed and amortized and at that point I mean maybe what we'll do is we'll switch everything to algal oil who knows I think that would be an interesting proposition and that may be the way that we go but in the meantime omega-3s are good for you and this is a way of providing them to everybody that needs them thank you